Okay, so just let me remind you what I was describing in, informally last time, and now I, I, I present 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 kind of algebra behind it, which was essentially due to Mendel. So uh, the key observation from where it, it starts, kind of bi biological, it's quite quite simple, but it, one could see the, there was something kind of remarkable behind it, and that was that when you there are certain phenotypes, phenotypic features, which are always appear in a very sharp and discrete form. For example, you may have two kinds of flowers, and uh, I mean the flowers that they may come in two different different phenotypes, say red and white, and it's never mixes. There is no mixture there. It's either red or white, and there were other features like that. And this was in a sharp contradiction with all mentality of, of the type. So this paper of Mendel was in, written in that about six years after the Darwin's Origin of Species. And at that time, Origin of Species was extremely influential. And the major main point made by Darwin was that all changes happen continuously. And that exactly which was kind of violated, violated in, in this example, this variation is very sharp. And there is no in between. Right. And another example which was considered considered 100 years prior to that, actually more than that, 100 years by Mepertie, who I uh, reluctant to write because uh, you, who, whom you know from mathematical physics, and he was uh, observing how was distribution of people with six fingers. Yeah, you know, sometimes there are families when there are six fingers, some have five, some six, six, and never they never have five and a half. Yeah, so to speak, there is no. And it's very discreet. And he uh, was observing statistics of that. And both Mendel and Kaimperti were kind of very much impressed by another fact. First, they're discrete. And secondly, statistics of that is a statistic of that kind of, when you start looking in different phenotypes, proportions are roughly integers. Yeah? So small integer numbers like this. Certain phenotypes may be distributed like one to three. And this is a kind of, it's never, of course, sharp, yeah? So, so if it will be 1.3 versus, you know, 2.7, 2. Uh, okay. perfect, yeah, from bi biology point of view, and say it's 1.3, and still it's incredible, yeah? Even small deviation, the probability of this being random is just zero, no matter how small this error, because it uh, appears many, many times, no matter how unlikely it is to happen random, to happen systematically is impossible, right? And this was realized by by Mepertie, who developed kind of conjectural theory different from from Mendelian, he was, which was not uh, quite correct. And then it was done by Mendel, completely missed by all biologists in between, including Darwin, who also were observing sometimes this phenomenon. And just you know, it was contradicting their philosophy, and so it be, couldn't make any sense of that. As you know, the, actually, the first, I think the first publication of Darwin paper, this actually was quite also amusing in many respects. Uh, this is when his first origin of species appeared. First, the major premises there was completely false. And it was pointed out to him that his model of heredity would never give the observable phenomenon. Exactly this continuity, whatever variation, advantages for the variation you have, it will be dissipated. And that's it. And, and then Darwin, so he, he, he missed it. But then solution he suggested was kind of what is now called returning to Lamarckism. It was not Lamarck who suggested that, inherit, so that new features you acquire during life may be inherited. But this now called Lamarckism incorrectly. And Darwin accepted that. So Darwin he just couldn't, couldn't figure out what to do. And, and uh, on the other hand, in, in, in the same first edition, he, him, he's not a kind of not, uh, somewhat unexplicable point. He analyzes, and this is extremely kind of good, good example of, of, of um, how things fit of concepts of natural selection, because usually example which brought in, in, in books are completely kind of irrelevant. Yeah, they're completely wrong. Yeah? I mean, they, they don't show anything like growing you know, long 
neck of a giraffe, or whatever, they just can be explained, or rather interpreted billions of ways. But what Darwin's, Darwin observed, that there is one particular phenomenon which is not so obvious and kind of paradoxical, and this is preservation of the sex ratio. That very many species have ratio half to half, despite the fact that their mating habits such that, like in particular for the sea elephants, when usually for one male, there are about 10 female. And the question is why we still have the same ratio. It would be kind of look absurd, because most of the males were not functional. Why, the, the, at birth, they were the same proportion. And Darwin gave an explanation quite reasonable. And then, in the following edition, however, this explanation disappeared. And Darwin was writing that, it was, that this was a, a mystery, how it could be. And then, about 70 years later, somewhere in 1920, Fisher, who was you know, a great statistician and mathematical biologist, suggests an explanation. Indeed, if you look from the point of view of your rights, very simple, the, 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 kind of, the very simple logic kind of saying that it must be so. Because if it's some, it's a, uh, albeit, you need fewer males, but each male will have more descendants, 10, 10 times more than female, and therefore it equilibrates and gives you one, one half, one half ratio. However, if you think about this carefully, and actually I remember last I spoke to Larry Guth without that, and he immediately found the flaw in this argument. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's superficially right, but Fisher never wrote it. It's usually he, he referred to. And apparently, it's not to totally clear actually how it works. And Darwin apparently realized that, and, and we, it disappeared from his later editions. Because usually people who said it, they say, well, because he was not editing himself, there was some mistake. But I don't think so, yeah? There is some interesting, actually logical, non-trivial logical point, and this. Uh, how, how it could be, what sustained this ratio uh, be, be being, be being close to one half. But, well, uh, but anyway, so there was this, there was this paper by, paper by, 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 by um, Mendel, and the point was, and this was, I think, extremely pronounced point, that the phenomen phenomenology is not kind of being inherited. And this, again, was a major misconception of, of, of people before Mendel. And this year made all this kind of evolution, theory lies nonsensical before him. But being inherited is some features, namely units, which is we'll call gene 20 years later. He didn't have this terminology. And so, so each gene was composition in, in, in diplodal organism of two, of, two, uh, of, of two alleles, and these are being inherited. These being inheritable units, and what we are observing, so there were two variables, say A and B, and phenotypes was function of A and B. But what was inherited was A and B, but not F. And this, in the way, for that reason, the result could have been not obvious. For example, when you mix two flowers, or, or say, say red flowers could have white descendants. Right, we have two parents, both are being red, and the children may be white. And the reason that the function, if you have here red and white for A and B, and color would be the function, and the, the kind of typical, typical function here would be that this will be always red unless this, yeah. Out of four combinations, only one give white, one white, white. And so, if you have parents red, white, and red, white, and their descendants may be pure white, white, white. So visible phenomenology is not inherited in a simple way. And this is a, is a reason, layer completely different. I think this was a completely incredible idea, extremely profound. And for that reason, it was not accepted for 30 years exactly because well beyond the level of intelligence of, of balance of that time. And um, on the other hand, well, maybe I'll come to this later, there was already similar development in, in physical and physical chemistry. The similar ideas were there. Now, how this being, so, 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 so the simple preliminary ob observation is that if you make this idea that there are two components in, in each, each f f pure, each pure phenotypic feature called it, represented by a gene, is composed of two units, maybe more when you have diploidal organism, but say two, 
for, for, from, for many of them. And there is a simple kind of function. And from that, you can say, aha, for example, if we have pure white parents, yeah, the all descendants will be white. If they have uh, red and white, they may have everything. But if you have select long enough for a particular one, they become all red and all white. Because you can, and, and then when you mix them, then there are certain proportions how, how they are being mixed, right? For example, you have red and red and white and white, two pure, and you interbreed them, then you may have four combination, but, 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 but this will have, will be three times, of course, rarer than combination red, 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 white, and white, red. Here there are three, here is one, so this one to three proportion. And this was in the, in the, head, in the head of Mendel. And uh, this is mathematics kind of. And again, this, uh, I was saying this kind of paradoxical thing is that by many at that time, even later, what Mendel was done was perceived with mathematics. On the other hand, natural selection seemed as biological phenomenon. But it's completely opposite. Principle of natural selection has nothing to do with biology. It just cut off exponential function. Absolutely purely pure mathematics. Because it's so trivial, it's easily accepted. And here is, is non-trivial biological phenomenon. Yeah, you discover conjecturally, you make some conjecture about structure of biology in mathematical language. And exactly because by order, more subtle and more sophisticated, people couldn't get it. Yeah. And it's even now, yeah, people argue, you know, about Darwin, da, 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 everybody understands it, agree or not. About Mendel, nobody argues because if you understand it, you don't argue, I mean, just, yeah. it's, it's, it takes some effort to understand all the implications of that. This for me actually a mystery. Biologists are not that excited by Mendel. They, they lie, they love Darwin, and I, 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 I don't understand why. Darwin was certainly a great philosopher, but not a great scientist. And, uh, and Mendel, on the contrary, we don't know what Mendel thought, because unfortunately all his documents after her death were burned for some reason. When he was an abbot, somewhere when the new abbot came, he burned all his documents for some political reason. Yeah. And so, so he, what he, Mendel thought, what he, he, he was working on another subject, by the way. And we don't know what he was doing, yeah. which is a pity. And uh, but, but the point, this is kind of so far, very, 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 if you just say possibilities, it's very qualitative and quantitative. You say everything happens as random as it conceivably can. And so, and the uh, conclusion from that, which was made by, by Mendel, and this is a hardy wide Principle, which I describe here in the second formula, but let me remind me again what it tells what it tells you. In biological terms, looks completely kind of Im 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 unfeasible. And again, we have a field of red flowers in another of white flowers, and they're separated first by mountain range. And then you erase it. In the first generation, proportion of red and white will be different. You may have more red and less white. Yeah. At least now colors, not their positions. But after the second generation, we'll have the same proportion. It stabilizes on the first stage and very much against intuition of people who believe in the selection. So I can say it shifted toward red because red were advantages. And then we'll, it must be keep moving there. It will not happen. Right? Which is, and, and people, yes, biologists were arguing about that and don't understand what was happening. And then, let me show you a formula in a second. Yeah, so this is, this is the formula. And, uh, and this exactly corresponds to a certain square of some map equal to itself. It's, it's important, and this is actually the formula. And this was incomprehensible if you speak uh, kind of in biological terms and just, uh, it's a kind of trivial formula in a way. But on the other hand, if you say it's in words, it's actually difficult to absorb it. And this was hardly done, he just, prove this formula. Yeah. And, uh, and as I said, he overlooked, however, so he was saying it somewhat differently, and I personally, um, what he says, yeah? Hardly. So you just can read, just. And um, the, the point, of course, is most not approving this or that formula, but he realized that uh, just this biological kind of discussion translates to very simple arith arithmetic. But then there is a next level of this arithmetic which he, which he kind of overlooked in this, which now I want to explain. 
So, and, and this kind of, I'm using this in, 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 in a way that's extremely, it's extremely instructive to think in this kind of, kind of, kind of biology suggests you what happens. And just generates mathematical objects, quite simple, but still not quite obvious. And uh, so let me remind you so what it is. So you have linear spaces, the distributions, and they have this kind of function which corresponds to so, so, uh, it's just non-trivial linear fu function when these are distribution of some entities, it's just summation of them. Yeah, and you can normalize having one if they are positive, if you probability distribution. But so all you have to know, this is just this is a vector space of a so of a reals, and this is a, a linear function. So what in this kind of abstract term will be this uh, 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 random matching? Yeah? So this is just general notation. When you have this deployed case, you, you, you have A and B two spaces with this kind of functions. And you take the tensor products. And in this tensor product, there is the self-mapping. Right, so you have a mixture. Uh, uh, so, so the, the point so of, of Mendel when you have a allele and b, you write it in, in this form. This kind of symbolic writing, a and b just abstract symbols. But however, you think them as in, independent variables, and you write them together, and these become quadratic polynomials, and they behave like quadratic polynomials if you interpret these numbers as probabilities. And this kind of kind of, kind of remarkable, and this kind of formal manipulation. But men will be doing have also statistical meaning, and you can kind of check them by, by, by experiment statistically. On the other hand, you have the kind of form of manipulation. And, and so, so, so what will be, what will be this self-mapping, right? So in, in, in naive terms, which I find quite transparent, however, I think mathematically unsuitable, if you think about this tensor product, a space of matrices, which is a tensor product of column by rows, so you take any entry, you take column and row, you summate elements in the column, you summate in the row, and, and multiply them, yeah? So you take column coming from some entry, some IG, then you take a row coming from IG. Again, I hate this notation, yeah? And multiply, take summation over this column, take the summation over this row and multiply them, yeah? So sum, sum, multiply. So you have a space, a map of matrices into themselves. And the point is this map square of this equal to itself, yeah? So it's a next generation map, it's a square. And this is uh, what happened there. Another point that the moment you make the description, you have pretty high symmetry in the, in the picture, which was not before. At, at most, you had symmetry of permutation of of your features, such as for the diploid organism, yes, permutation of two elements. But immediately what enters here is a, it's a linear group preserving this core vector. But in fact, in a second we shall see, it's a bigger group, it's a full linear group and they were operating there. So there is high symmetry and the symmetry explain this and also some other things. So, so what comes next? And this is a, the, the formula in terms, in again, this I described in a kind of, kind of algebraic term, this is extremely kind of easy to, to see, but if you come back to this uh, distribution picture, so you have the distribution of genes, but corresponding distribution of this allels will be A plus B. And so it's kind of a bizarre map from polynomial point of view. You have a polynomial, you replace each product, each product you replace by sum, and then, you square it. And then this operation when you repeat it twice becomes it important. Right? And this is kind of I'm, 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 I'm using thing because except for the scalar product, of course it's not a it's not a polynomial map, it's a rational map because you have to normalize all the time you have to normalize by a total sum. And this is a ra rather amazing when you have a polynomial and you compose it with itself and it's equal to itself times constant. 
if you divide by this constant, it becomes square. And typically, you expect degrees of polynomial grow when you compose them, and it doesn't happen here. And uh, if you, you see in, in the next level, we shall see that this is exactly the same phenomenon which, you, which brings in nilpotent Lie groups. Nilpotent Lie groups, nilpotent Lie groups, exactly of, of this kind, yeah? When you have group of polynomial transformations which transform certain space and degree doesn't grow. And this is exactly is what nilpotency comes in. This is a kind of rather phenomenon. It's already all, all in this kind of mental, mental description of, of genes, yeah? Okay, this is just see simple formula, simple algebra, which is uh, how things are being done. Yeah, this is more or less almost as written in Mendel's paper, almost almost his notations. And again, but this kind of formula look a little bit kind of strange. But now, if you turn back to this tensorial product picture, it's extremely, extremely simple because if you want to show, so what is this map in these terms? Because when you have tensor product of spaces which is functional, you can proje there are projections to A and to B. So the fundamental thing about tensor products, you cannot project them to their factors. Yeah, and this is a kind of a, so what makes quantum mechanics so kind of tricky. Yeah. There is no, you know, you cannot see part of a system. Things are kind of entangled. If you mix two things by tensor product, it's not direct sum. Then you cannot separate them. You can't project back. However, if you have this thing, you can do it easily, right? Because for each monomial, you just go to A times B, right? And this gives you a linear projection to A and to B, and similar linear projection to A. Right? So if you have this extra, if you, whenever you have a little extra structure, you have this, this bracket functional. Yeah, it's, so in, 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 for in Hilbert space, you have brackets between two. And this is a kind of mono operation. Then you can do it. And then you can multiply the two. <laughs> and whenever you have this projection to A and projection to B, you can take back you can just multiply them back, take their, pro pro their tensor products. And this kind of obvious square will be the, when you square it, you just multiply by, you just multiply by this. And if this normalized to have being probability space, so these are ones, so it becomes square become one, right? So it's extremely simple. And this is a, it's hard dividing principle. In just a different moment, I was making a different, Estimate of this on Google. I'm coming again to Hardy Weinberg. So what I done yesterday gave me the following. Actually, even before I remember, I was doing it, and this ratio was not one over eight, but one over thirty. And I don't know why. It's just like when I was writing this article five years ago. And of course, this Google doesn't give you kind of fair, fair estimate. So Hardy is you know, was extremely disrespectful to, of applied mathematics. And this is just he's done, you know, just playing golf with his friends for a matter of seconds. And this was the most significant contribution he made to science. Just, you know, in, in science, nobody cares about anything he's done except for this kind of uh, computation, which is uh, kind of, it's, in a way, it's not relevant or true genetics, but still it gives you kind of frame, frame for, for thinking. Yeah and always being referred to. Because the, pro the problem is that in, in a biological system, really, this never happens. Yeah? We never have this pure mixing, this random mating, because there are extra factors. And one, of course, is selection, uh, which is there is the superposition of that the, with environment. Environment kills somebody. And not that it kills envi more advantages, less advantages, but some, somebody being selected. Just this happens. It's another, of course, misconception of, 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 of concept of selection. Things are being selected not because they're better, because it just, just all happened. Yeah. And the most example is advantages yes, is being, being lucky. And, uh, and then, but still, even then, for example, if you have flowers of a different kind, you may prefer particular flowers and always just choose 
seeds of flowers of a certain color. Still, however, the map which you have will be bilinear map. So these maps you have in, in, in these spaces will be still quadratic. And so you have a quadratic map on a, on a product of simplices. And they have very kind of tricky dynamics. They never stabilize on the first step, but they stabilize asymptotically. They often converge to, to equilibria points. And this equilibria usually vertices of the simplex. And there is a kind of, kind of significant mathematics behind it. And another factor, of course, is that the space geometry is involved, right? Because you, there is, mating is not, not that random. It depends. It depends. You know, if, if you're far away, you cannot mate. This another, by the way, amusing point that just for me is mysterious: the fact that if you have separated population and they cannot mix, and this seems no big deal. However, there is a biologist called Ernst Mayer who's very, very famous, essentially because he's famous exactly for saying that, with great kind of emphasis, right? This it is related to the concept of species. And it's, again, it's just very kind of confusing. Who first made this definition of species? Yeah? And apparently, the, the, it's not definition, but there is a phenomenon which was emphasized by Buffon and, you know, quite a while ago, of course. And the phenomenon is that you may have descendants of kind of different species, right? like donkey and horse can give you actually two, ty two types of animals, mule, or oh, I've forgotten how it's called another one. And, but then it stops. These are, are, are not fertile. Yeah, they have no, no, no great children. And that was quite, kind, of, kind, of, kind of remarkable before kind of realized that. And he suggested this is what divides different species. And then it was staying so for quite a while. And then came Ernst May and said, well, but even or if they live on different, in different kind of continents, they also don't, cannot have children. And so you have to correct the definition. And he became very famous as Ernst May and just actually everything Ernst May was saying was on the same level. And biologists just loved it. It's unclear to me what, what the point. Yeah? Because this is, again, phenomena emphasized by Buffon is extremely non-trivial. And it was understood only with development of genetics. Why it happens on the second generation, not on the first? So what's so special about the number two? And it's yet number two is 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 uh, has something to do with DNA having two strands, sort of, or with diploidy. It's really on the, these two shows on the molecular level. It's reflection of something happening on the molecular level, not just being on different continents. Okay, so this is the point. And so, so what we go, go next. Now, just again about these formulas, which I wrote before, just to see that there is a kind of algebra. Just look at this. Yeah. So it happened for diploidal organism, how the thing would behave. And I just, you just can read it. I don't want to repeat it. There are some little formulas. In it, but in a second, they kind of rather tricky. Now, these formulas kind of rather tricky what happens. But in a second, I just I want to show how you can see them in a very simple way along the lines I indicated, and which leads to a class of very interesting dynamical system. This was the point. Ah, this is what I was mentioning, that, um, um, that space may uh, interfere. And on trivial point, unlike what Meyer was saying was done by this equation of these people, that you can write differential equation. You can incorporate into random mating, into this random stochastic differential equation, incorporate space. And you have quite interesting differential equation. And again, mathematically, it's quite attractive. But it has biological significance, hard to say. Yeah. The, the, my experience, from what I know, even highly developed in a kind of sophisticated mathematical means done in this kind of biology usually happens to be wrong. One of those, some person called May, I believe. yeah. You probably one you, you know him about his development mathematical uh, mathematical theory of uh, for ecologists and it was very hail. He didn't receive Nobel Prize, but it was close to that. But then everything happened to be wrong when data were collected more carefully. It was all data, all, all based on not sufficient data. So all these equations I mean, just they I'm using, but and, and actually what I'm doing I'm only speaking about the equations because they're amusing, not because they really have biological biological weight. But what another point which I want to bring in, however, this is a 
that Mendelian law, similar to this law of mass action in, 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 in chemistry, and this kind of, again, big mathematical world, usually unvisited by, by mathematicians. And I want to say a couple of words about that. So when you have a chemical reaction, and there are some ingredients, and this molecule must come together, probability of them coming together is product of densities with some weights of each of them, right? If the more of them have to come together, the, the less likely it is. Which means that you immediately arrive at, at class of polynomial equations, differential equations with polynomial coefficients. And however, these equations and the way to look at them is absolutely not the way mathematicians speak about differential equations. So first, it should be noted, I, I think it's correct, somebody told me, I haven't checked myself, that say two thirds, if not more, of all articles on differential equations are written by chemists, not by mathematicians. And they have a huge amount of equations they want to understand. And secondly, their philosophy is nothing to do with the classical, what you know nowadays, the stability of dynamical systems. Because one of the major points in, say, in chemistry, at least in, in industrial chemistry, that even when you have a simple process, like burning of, of, of hydrogen, the number of intermediate products just goes into in hundreds. And so one of the phenomena, so, so, so this is what I said, give you immediately differential equation. However, if you look actually at, 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 deeper at this chemistry, you see it's not like that. There are lots and lots of intermediate products. Yet the equation behave as if, the process behave as if they're not there. So there is a remarkable phenomenon, purely mathematical. You have a process when there are lots and lots of ingredients, but they're somehow being erased, and only you have a shadow, you have this naive equation. This equation, by the way, was discovered by Gulbert and Wage in, in, in Norway a few years before Mendel, but that paper was completely kind of, it, uh, went unnoticed, and then was rediscovered uh, about 15 years later by, by, by somebody else, by Van Hoff, and that was kind of interesting also. Point. This is a major equation, of course, in chemistry, like in biology, just ideal, ideal chemistry, not real chemistry. But mathematically, it's extremely kind of interesting class of equations. And there are two points that are very different from what mathematicians do. So one, so it, it runs in a high dimensional space. But this number, it's not a number. It's high dimensional space where here it's some structural object because there are this many different chemicals have different properties, have different input. So, and in many cases, you can reduce at this dynamic to understanding combinatorics of this set representing dimension. Right? So, yes, one work which I n n know here, and again, it's, it's done by, by, by applied mathematicians. Actually, they, I know two was by applied mathematician. But in fact, one of them probably pertains to, 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 to what is now called tropical geometry. That there is a kind of tropical limit of this equation because these parameters spread in a kind of large way. And so there is a limit of, this, of many of these system differential equations that become combinatorial. And this correspond, the very even, yes, this has been done in the model when the equation are linear, and it's, again, it's quite very amusing that you look at the system of linear equations with constant coefficients, and you believe you know everything about that. It's just linear algebra. However, if you think about this linear algebra, so you have this space of matrices, and what happens to this equation depends on how the matrix degenerates. And so this depends on stratification by rank of the matrices and some curve how you approach it. And this is it's highly, highly kind of non-trivial non phenomenon in non the way how it can happen. And there are this, these limits. But for, for, for realistic equation, it still has not been done. And another instance of that, uh, of this kind of differential, is his, the point which I want to partly make with this lecture is that dynamical systems motivated, say, by biology or chemistry, are infinitely far from what was done by, math by my mathematicians for the last 45 years. There is a well-developed theory of differential equations, partly supported by physics, but completely kind of missing the problems in either in chemistry or in biology. It's completely kind of oriented in a different way. So, so one of the point is that dimension is not a number, in, in, in never. Yeah. 
dimension is something we uh, understanding which is a kind of fundamental. You cannot change the kind of coordinates are not symmetric at all. Different coordinates have different weight, different symmetries, etc. And another point is that because people love just having aha, uh -huh, you have this kind of chaotic equation, you have a hyperbolic system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is, however, practically never happens in biological system. The moment your say heart or your uh, genes uh, network start working in this chaotic regime, you are dead. Right? The whole point is that amazingly, that despite pre uh, the fact that hyperbolic system kind of typical, the system chosen both by, ke by chemistry and by biology are opposite. They usually tend to have simple equilibrium point. And then, and this is a mathematical question, under what conditions, what classes of systems would behave? They're very complicated, they're very high dimensional system. Again, one of the points, they're all very high dimensional, right? And, uh, and uh, in, 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 why? they behave in such a simple way. And this is extremely, again, controversial issue because, for example, the following point is completely kind of not, not settled. Say, if, if you say, say in cell, the regulation of function of the cell, there are a variety of enzymes. And the point is, is it essential that enzyme have certain parameters very finely tuned or they're very robust? And that's unclear. And there are just, you speak with people, they have very opposite views on that. So, and, uh, and it's, it's one point. Secondly, concept of stability, in all very simple ex examples, does not fit stability, the stability of, of, uh, of kind of how it's understand the dynamical system in the classical, more modern dynamical system theory. For example, and just again, if you think in, in, in simple terms, it's kind of obvious to you. We are rather stable with respect to very many um, perturbations. You can take the temperature, you can eat various kinds of food, and you function. But you have tiny little molecule of something poisonous, and you are dead. All right? So you're stable in a particular range. So this stability is very kind of specified stability. And there is no mathematics for that. Yeah. But again, this is diversion. Yeah. So, so this is I I instance of this, of, of Mendel, when things are um, quite nice. So this I'm describing this, what I told you, why the square is, is it important, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. What I uh, wrote before, yes, in tensorial terms, just this formula which I wrote before, you see, so this is, this formula is a generalization of this, what I wrote before, this formula of Hardy. Where it was, oh. Yeah, here is a formula which Hardy wrote, essentially, and just he's saying, well, this is multiplication type table mathematics. However, this formula, if you write it properly, it uses to, as to what I wrote before, and uh, which would, yeah, to what it, what's written here, yeah, a, a times b equals c or something, right? This implies that. So there is no addition in this formula. It's purely multiplicative formula, right? In a way, it's multiplication table, but only multiplication. And it's not about numbers, but just associativity of the product. And this I mean, is unclear to me. So why, 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 why hard do you overlook that? Because it's, you don't have to write any formulas to, to see that, yeah? It's not a computational fact, it's just coming from functory from symmetry of that. And, but then it becomes more interesting when you look for diploid organisms. They are not very, very common, but mathematically it's really kind of become kind of more amusing and this brings in uh, the next level of, 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 of mathematics of the picture. So what have, how you think about that? So diploidy means that now you may have, kind of formally speaking, yeah, many parents, not two, but d different parents. And that you borrow your DNA from this, from, from them. And each of them has some number of alleles, which means that you have spaces, AI, and you take the tensorial product, and I runs from, from one to I equals, I'm sorry. 
the zero product from i to one to this. Right. So your object, I, oh, so right, you mix now not two, like A, B. Genus combination of the blue, but maybe A, B, C. That the G already used, I cannot use letter G because G was the number of these terms. Yeah. So that is tensor products. And I want to think about these tensor products as polynomial in these variables, right? Because tensor products, of course, you can th think about them as just p p polynomials having degree one in each variable. And I just embed it into the space of all polynomials. Because, so what, what, what it, 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 it give immediately kind of gives you kind of a much more, much more transparent way to think about everything. Now, what was this thing, yeah? It was a summation of entries. Now, when you have polynomial and you sum of all coefficients, it corresponds to evaluate polynomial at, su at some vector, 1, 1, 1 is coin, 1, 1. However, polynomial is just all, all the same. So it can easily take point 0. And so this may be understood as just free term of the polynomial. So just this means polynomial take its value at 0. And immediately, all formulas disappear. Yes, all these formulas in genetics immediately disappear because it's free term. You don't have to make summation. You just because. The space of polynomials is invariant on the translation of the base space. So this is uh, what you have. Now, how you describe now all these maps? And this has become quite nice, quite nice description in, in terms of polynomial. So I want to describe some interesting. I have a space of polynomials. They have some where variables divided into some G groups, yeah, corresponding to different others, right? They, and uh, a, pri a priori polynomials have a degree one in each of them, but we don't have to bother about this anymore. We don't have to say it. They're just polynomial. How we can map space of polynomial into it, it themselves in, in this kind of style, yeah? So what these maps are now, they are as follows. So let me now describe some class of maps in, 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 in general terms. So I have this projection, remember, A times B. I have project to A and to B. Provided, of course, I had this operation. So what it means in terms of polynomial? So to each polynomial, in many variables, I want to assign polynomial in fewer variables. So but if you, this variable split, I just project my space to this coordinate. And when I project it, and pull it back. So I, I, I have a very simple projection from polynomials on the whole space. Uh, they, they, they come to polynomial here, and then again extend to the whole space. So I have this is endom endomorphism in the space of polynomials just induced to projection to the coordinate space. Right? And then what I'm doing, so, so, so these are these corresponding to these projections. But then I just can multiply them. And then it's, they, these are my maps. So I have endomorphisms in the ring of polynomials. There are this endomorphism corresponds to projection to this, uh, to this subspace, and then I multiply them. And the moment I multiply them, they are not endomorphisms anymore, but they are multiplicative endomorphisms. Right? So, and, and, and these maps, in, in general, may be rather, rather complicated, but we consider projections to mutually independent subspaces and multiply this. And so this, uh, to, to, to them, this principle applies. Square of such a map equals to the map itself times a scalar, a scalar product. Where the scalar product comes? So let me explain. So what will be the formula? So you have this, call these subspaces. Okay, and I just use the notation which I have here. Maybe I already have it here. I don't have to repeat the formula. Yeah, this is what's written, what I was saying. And now there is this formula. So I have collection. I have a collection of these subspaces. I project. I take another collection, I project. When I compose them, I can see the old intersection and multiply them. So it's a very simple formula. Which, in the case when you apply, the way essential is 
that which I suppressed, but it had, had to be said. Even if we have an empty subspace, operation makes sense. It's just taking the free term constant term in the polynomial. Right? So empty, empty sets, empty coordinate sets, or, 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 or zero ones still gives you, uh, give you something. They give you a free term of your, of your polynomial. Like when you evaluate polynomial zero, it, all coordinates zero, all remains a free term. So, and if we have this one given by ki, another by given by k prime j. So what you do, all, all their intersection and take their product. But the constant coming exactly when they have empty intersections. And so there is this formula. Again, it's simple algebra, but it has, again, this quasi-biological meaning. That you compose, when you multiply such a map with itself, you come up with the same map, but with a coefficient, with this free constant term in this degree corresponding how many this intersection is empty. Right? And this is, is this most general hard dividing formula. If you look, yes, actually, from where I started, because I was trying to read in, this in, in Wikipedia, and I didn't bring there is a formula there, you know, just huge formula uh, describing that. And it's so huge because you evaluate polynomial at the wrong point. And then it has all these binomial coefficients, just tremendous mass coming in. But in, in this is just. Uh, this is what happens here. OK. Now, so what? But these are not the real maps. It's just, yes. Uh, another interesting feature, yeah, maybe, again, about this kind of maps. So there's, so the point is here that you start with some sp linear spaces. And there are simple maps, just linear projection on them. And out of them, you construct maps on the, in spaces of polynomials. And these maps have the kind of, the kind of rather remarkable feature that the degree doesn't grow, grow kind of only on the constant term when you want to compose them. So they behave like transformation or endomorphism of, of, of important Lie groups. Right? This is a interesting feature of them. And then there is a next level. Yeah, and, and, and they, uh, so it's, in another point, this map, they are non-linear map. Yeah, they're kind of rather complicated map, you, if you think about them. And I was mentioning, just yes, to, to be respectful of these maps, just consider the simplest instance of that, when you go from linear, uh, space of linear form to the quadratic form, just take square, right? This very innocuous operation, with a linear form. So this is the sum of ci, xi. And you just square it, and you have quadratic polynomials. And, and this kind of, the, the kind of things you, 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 you do here, yeah? But just, just again, just to be respectful of this map, just think how it looks like. So it's a very, has amazingly, amazingly non-trivial geometry. So if you apply it to the union sphere in Rn, say I, 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 Rn, it goes to the union sphere in this space. I, I keep the something like that, maybe plus or minus 1 over 2. And it's, it's identify opposite point. So I have a projective space embedded there. And this is kind of simplest instance of very nice, very nice variety. So it is a projective space lying in the sphere in a kind of extremely symmetric in a kind of well-balanced way. And, it gets, and as I said before, it gives count example probably to many conjectures you can imagine about sets. It has kind of very kind of un unexpected property. As, as I mentioned before, for example, give count example immediately to some words of conjecture about partition of sets into something. Just immediately. Yes, people who make conjecture never looked at this set. This is a, one of the basic sets. Another feature of that, if they convex hollow of it, it gives you especially if you do it in a conical way. yeah. Now you take the whole map, not only on the sphere, image is something, and, and the convex hull of this is a cone of positive definite forms. So you have this positive definite forms and ex extremal point, exactly image of this map. And this is, a, of course, the most uh, kind of significant cone in mathematics, yeah? Yes, positive definite forms. So people say prob usual probability cone is just, you know, positive coordinates. But this has, it, it's another cone having maximal symmetry. 
And so permutation group replaced by orthogonal group. And this is because it's fundamental for, for, for quantum mechanics. Yeah, it's all cone of positive definite self-adjoint operators. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of geometry, extremely kind of, I mean, just, just to think about that. You see, you have a convex set of dimension about 10 squared over 2, and extremal points make this kind of perfectly symmetric, perfectly symmetric thing. So, and all these kind of segregated variety varieties are by no means, by no means simple. But the theory doesn't kind of, kind of gene genetic goes to the next level now. And this kind of amusing suggests what it suggests. Yeah, by the way, here I wrote something. So we have this kind of maps. So again, I repeat, they're very simple maps. You, you take a polynomial, you restrict it to certain subspaces and extend them constant in the op p p perpendicular direction. In other way, you project, you project, you take linear, pro say normal projections to these linear subspaces and take induced transformation polynomials. And then multiply several of them where the space are just joined, right? And then kind of this, they, I call them equilibrating map in a second I explain in the second part of my lecture when I come to the entropy, I explain why they, in what sense they are equilibrating. And, uh, and then I wrote something, actually just when I was preparing this lecture, today I had some uh, problem with my time, but I, I just couldn't figure it out. Yeah, I say just, I, I wrote this, uh, obviously, this uh, I find, but now I must say I don't quite see. It. It must be obvious, but I couldn't figure it out when coming here because uh, there was some problem with zero error in my time, was because uh, travel was not so smooth. And so I just came to explain why. Yeah. Yeah. It's obvious. I mean, I, I wrote it obvious. I remember it was uh, quite obvious when I was writing it. Yeah. But this, you know, the situation where you write an article. Things are obvious and then not obvious. <laughs> yeah, this, this, is, this is kind of linear algebra, simple, simple algebra. But now when I look at the example, it doesn't look to me quite right. So I, I shall see that. And, um, but then the point, see, yeah, this is just for, for the moment we leave it as it is. But so what is good about this map, they commute. Now, all these maps which I described, they commute with a full linear group operating on each of those components. So on my linear space divided into coordinates divided into the group, I have a linear group operating on each of them, and the whole picture invariant under the action of all these groups, which is bigger than the original group, by the way. Yeah? So the, 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 the picture is extremely symmetric. In particular, you can scale polynomials. You just can multiply each variable by a constant. And which brings kind of uh, uh, thing from afar, uh, localizes them, which shows that these maps actually linearizable. Of course, there is another kind of linearization, as, uh, uh, which I had to mention before. So these maps have all, all very simple dynamics. But another uh, reason for that was As follows, if you, they, these maps preserve degrees of polynomials. So polynomials of degree in each variable less than something remain these properties. For example, you have a linear form, you multiply them, total degree grows, but degree with respect to each variable doesn't grow. So and you can think about them as transformation in the space of truncate polynomials, which is it's a ring, and in this ring there is exponential map. An exponential map almost onto. So if any polynomial which starts with, okay, with, with, positive, with positive free term, a constant term is admits a logarithm. And this again shows that this, and this is by the way present in, in, in many, many work in, in this kind of dynamics. People kind of rewrite and take a formula. So if you write this explicit formula for the exponential, it certainly will be extremely, okay, extremely complicated. Term, but this is it's, it's again quite 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 remarkable that this nonlinear, highly nonlinear transformation, however linearizable, except of course by exponential map. But another reason for linear, linearization, somewhat, which is uh, doesn't depend on that, and more general, is that these maps are invariant, uh, commute with very large group, and, 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 but this but essential part of the group is just scaling transformation. So 
And because the invariant with respect to scaling, any global phenomenon brings to one point, and the, it's, it, it, at this point, everything determined by differential, and then it can go back to the large scale, right? So these maps, they on the large scale, behave the same as on the small scale, which means they conjugate to linear maps. And then that, as a consequence of that, I guess I want to say this kind of a, uh, another essential theorem. Uh, essential theorem, which is again motiv motivated motivated by by, 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 by by genetics. So this will be kind of the last um, step of the formal genetic. Then it doesn't go anymore, and then I'll show you where one can go from there. So so far we're speaking about one locus. So there is a genome; it contains a kind of a gene, it contains many loci. Well, each gene may have many copies, but they correspond. Yeah. Everything I was saying concerning one lock is if the rest was not there. However, in reality, you have gene, genome, and there are many, many parts of this. And, and there is a kind of uh, what's called recombinations. You have a mixture of these features here and there. So imagine you have two genes, so you can, uh, something happens to one, the same happens to the second. And again, assume the thing happens as independently as it can be. And uh, so independence. As I said before, it's again a very tricky assumptions. So probability is cannot exist without it, right? Yes. Yes, all probability theory depends on something is independent or nearly independent or something. Otherwise, you just, you know, it's just nothing can be said. It's, and also, and here, if you think what this means, it means exactly that there is high symmetry acting on, on the system. And this is why you can accept such an assumption, yeah? Because symmetry applies to objects prior to, 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 to any kind of probability. For example, in statistical mechanics, this is especially kind of clear, right? If you think about classical statistical mechanics, you see that symmetry is much more kind of relevant than probability per se. So you have a system of, of 10, something like 2 to 25 particles, yeah? Which is how many, you know, I, I, I have you know, in this space, yeah? So uh, this more or less this number of particles of air in this volume. It was, well, it's slightly less, yeah, probably 24. And, but then imagine how each of them, particle may be only in two states. So I have so many particles. So each particular state in the system has probability of something like that. So, you know, so what is this? I mean, physically, of course, it makes no sense, yeah? We don't, these numbers, you know, the, lo the, the more you can go, I think minus 46, yeah, this conjecture Planck scale, even that, of course, is unavailable, yeah. It's, but beyond that, it just makes no sense. However, exactly where we, which number we operate, yeah, the probability theory appeals to that. However, the point is, you don't have to do that, and you can accept this, just because the system is fully symmetric. If articles, all particles are the same, and you can assume permutation group X there, and then you can say, huh, this is a number, it makes the meaning, but, it, it, but the, the point is the different such number, right? This equality makes sense, despite the fact that nine, 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 uh, these two don't make sense. Yeah? Now you can say that they are equal probabilities, even that, though this, as numbers they don't exist. And that is the point which is kind of, you know, kind of underappreciated. So probability theory is very much kind of representation theory. And actually, it's getting more and more apparent these days, yeah? When you know, new, new branches come and this probability disappears, and just representation theory and you know, symmetry enter there, right? And uh, it's the same, of course, applies to, 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 many, to, many, to many other systems. But um, so this is a huge symmetry, which is the reason this is genetics. And, uh, so in, case, in the case of our, our genome, this hidden symmetry, when you have long genomes, and you can have switching over loci, so it's a the big group which operates there, very kind of familiar group, which is the same with throwing a coin. It's just you have group Z divided by 2Z in very high power. Right, so you have, again, extremely small probability of any event, but this symmetry act there. And assuming everything is independent, you may ask what, what happens with, with, with kind of evolution, so to speak, which is there is not, no, nothing changes. It's just there is a reorganization 
of, of genetic material. So the point that in all these pictures, there is no change in genetic material or, or individual gene change, but, but uh, what's called the, the content remain the same, right? So there are kind of basic in units which are being inherited, and there a relative proportion does not change. So nothing happens. What you see, visible change. Phenotypes run along kind of a certain process, but, in, but the, kind of the, the fundamental genetic material in the population does not change. And this is exactly what the principle of, of Mendel, where it was in great disagreement with, with Darwin. In, in fact, it does because there are mutations, but there's a secondary effect, right? All this evolution happens on a much slower, slower scale, in, in essential invisible yeah? in, in nature. You, you see it very, very, kind of very poorly. Yeah? What, but what you see is kind of this mixture of, of re rearrangement of, of, of alleles in, 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 in populations, which is, for under mating, it's constant. Right? Just nothing happens. And however, there are many of them which doesn't stabilize on, on the first step, however, it is exponentially converges to equilibrium. And this is this theorem of this guy which I mentioned. And this follows from the fact Yeah, Robin is getting convergence property. It says that if you have this you now any kind of population and they exchange, they have a, a random mating and a, a random recombination, the exponentially fast converge to equilibrium situation where equilibrium means that your polynomial is product of polynomials of, of, of with respect to each variable. So we have, we remember, these variables divided into these blocks. And so the distribution of polynomials will be just product of this polynomial. And this is where, where we come from. And the formula the, for that, the maps which are involved, are just which one described. They are not, they are not this original multiplicative endomorphisms, but they are convex combinations. But however, because each of them invariant under this big linear group, this, uh, they behave as if as linear maps. So essentially, this convex combination of them behave like linear maps. So there is one attractive fixed point. And then immediately you may ask, what, what are kind of so, so, so the formalism coming to what you arrive kind of mathematically is the following class of, of dynamics. You have a commutative algebra, in this case, concated polynomials, or it may be infinite dimensional algebra, and you have some <coughs> endomorphism of this algebra. So I know, so alpha i. And this, if it is commutative algebra, it's this endomorphism corresponds to self-mapping of the space of, of maximal ideals. So they think about them as functions in certain space, or some quotient of some space of functions. And so there are simple transformations. And then there are very simple, otherwise nothing works. Then you can see the products of those for certain. And then you take convex combination of this. Right, you multiply some of them and then create convex combination. And from that you produce often kind of simple, comprehensible, but still non-trivial dynamics. And this kind of outshot from a mathematical point of view at what you kind, of, kind of dynamics you want to understand. Right, so you start from this kind of random breeding and come to this class of the dynamical systems and you want to understand them and see, ah, what are the other examples? So one of the examples, which is the one I described, and the second example is even more, more classical. And let me see is if, if I have it here uh, written, which everybody knows. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's here, here, what, what I was skipping is just Mm, different variation of the theorem. Right. So look at the algebra of L1 function in the Euclidean space with respect to convolution. And consider this kind of transformation. And, and then the kind of fundamental theorem says that it has a, a unique attractive fixed point which is Gaussian distribution. 
So the, the normal law is exactly of the same nature as the one which is uh, this, this Mendel formula of stabilization of population. You have this algebra, you have endomorphism exactly of the same nature, and then it immediately become clear that there must be many, many of such normal kind of laws, right, corresponding to different endomorphisms of this algebra, but yeah, I don't, I haven't looked carefully in the literature and the language, of course, if there is a, in this in probabilistic, probabilistic in literature, certainly I couldn't, couldn't extract. So, on this, I want to finish um, what I was saying about Mendelian dynamics. Okay, I say again a few words about Sturzewand, and then I switch to entropy and return to Sturzewand in the end of my lectures, just because it's still came. So, <coughs> Because this more or less kind of mathematics we know, and there are many suggestions which are not, has not been pursued, but they're still kind of within, within traditional mathematics. But then there was the next very simple step, again, biologically, relatively simple step. S simple by description, not simple by, by, by how it was achieved, quite ingenious, which brings, potentially brings a very different kind of mathematics which has not been at all touched at all. By, 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 by mathematicians, and I was mentioning this last time, and I want to repeat it again. And it was done by, by brought up by Surtivan, who worked in the lab of Morgan. And that the same kind of logic, similar kind of Mendelian type of logic, allows you to reconstruct the geometry of the genome. Namely, that before any kind of understanding of molecular knowledge of genes, just knowing that they kind of, that there are these units behind pure phenotypes. So if you breed any of some particular feature, and eventually, you know, is a definite kind of phenotype, it may appear in certain forms. And then you know it is, it's a result of decomposition of, uh, of usually several units, usually of two, who deploy the organism and they're all in two alleles, yeah? So there are these hidden units of inheritance, which are not phenotypes, you see, that's the whole point. They're kind of hidden. But knowing, having this idea in mind, you can say the genes, which are a combination of, of these, are, are organized geometrically lie on the line. Right? So here we have this kind of abstract kind of polynomial predata, where this line may come, by this one-dimensional geometry, and how we can see it. And uh, so the idea or, 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 or of Hirschwand was extremely simple, and, uh, and so he reconstructed, he, he, I, I think for him it was a priori clear that it must be linear, but what he actually done, he, he determined the position of about a dozen genes on, on, on one of the chromosomes who was positioned where. And so what, what in input he had. So the input was this collection of these Drosophila flies in the lab of Morgan. They have bred fly with very, very pure properties. And then we are interbreeding them and looking at statistics of appearance of different features. Right? And because they were kind of purely bred, they could say how different genes were recombining and uh, appearing there. On the basis of this kind of statistical data, one could say, aha, that these features corresponding, representing genes, were actually linearly organized. There was a linear geometry there, right? And it looks first completely incredible, but then it's very similar, in my view, to what Poincaré, how Poincaré was suggesting our brain reconstructs spatial symmetry out of, out of images, right? So this is a problem that you have your, your eyes, there is a retina, you move your head, image moves, so this image and this image, and they have nothing in common for your brain, yeah? They come to different neurons, to different places, and the brain in different spots. In what sense, how you know they're the same image? Right? And that's, so Poincaré was considering this, and he suggested some solution, again, idea of a solution, of course, and uh, which is, I think, very much in the spirit of what we know today of neuro, what neuroscience we're doing. Of course, neuroscientists don't know the, of, of Poincaré, and Surichavan didn't know about Poincaré either. And, but mathematically, it is a very similar phenomenon. 
And what enters here now, say, say, say about 31 is much easier, the idea is as follows. So you can recognize genes uh, by features. So genes are just something representing certain, phen certain phenotypes. Right? And then you observe the certain phenotypes often go along. Right? For example, you may have, you may have you know, black, black hair and long hands more often than, than not. Of course, for, for it's different features go for flies. flies their basic features, the color of their eyes, the color of their body, the shape of the body, the shape of the wings. They develop the whole language, how to describe precisely these features. They observe that some of these features were going along more often than others. And then you say, aha, so how it happens? That recombination occurs when you cut these two brains and switch this to this. And those which are close together being switched relatively rarely, and those which are far away may be switched completely independently. Actually, one of the laws of Mendel of independence of, of this corresponds to the features positioned in different chromosomes. And when they're in different chromosomes, they're kind of independent, right? They, they're furthest. And if they're highly dependent, it means, and they're usually positively correlated, they're close. And you can say from this matrix, you can reconstruct uh, the, uh, the statistics, yeah? Knowing correlation of appearance corresponding correlation between features corresponding to different genes, you can say this correlation, you interpret this as a distance. Take pro proper function, does it become distance? And then you say, aha, uh -huh, it happens to be one dimension. Of course, it was not like that, as I said before. It was on the order relation, not the metric, but that's the logic of that. And in the same way, and I, again, I say it's oversimplifying, you can speak about what Dan Pomponcare, so let me repeat again this mathematical question which is not very well posed, but is uh, as follows. So how you construct geometry? You have a set and it has geometric structure. So here is a set of genes, right? Or it may be screen with some pixel and geometric structure, the one superimposed by images. So the screen shows you three space and three space or two space if dimensional has some symmetry. How, how this reflected here. And the point is that you have a measure on the set of subsets in there. For example, which is more transparent in the, in the case of this, of, of this screen. So you look picture after picture after picture, and you say how the set, and some things are white and black, and so you have a measure those which say black. Yeah? And so you have a measure on the set of the subsets, or in partition in two sets. Of course, you cannot truly observe this measure. It's huge space, but you have samples. So you have what you believe representative samples. And from that, you want to say, aha, the space has certain geometry. Now, how we can do that? Say, here or there, it is a, it is a, a let's do the same we done here, done, done for images. So again, the, the way you imagine it, you have your pixel, and then they enumerate in some idiotic way. You don't know how they enumerate it, right? How your brain enumerates, if it, it does at all, of course, it doesn't do it. Uh, your, your the cell receptor cell in your retina, of course, it doesn't do it. But so it is just this set, which has no structure. And sometimes you see kind of images, some of them being black and some being white. And this kind of systematically repeats. Can you say, aha, that this came from a world with orthogonal symmetry? Or maybe it was the other symmetry. Right? So you have a set, abstract set, which has no structure. But all you have, you have many instances of subsets there. So you have a million, a trillion uh, copies of the same set. It's the same set. It's very important to identify elements. But you kind of have light or color on different subsets. How you can say? That this came from our world, but not from universe, you know, with some kind of a, a, a very foreign for us kind of geometry. And here, of course, it's the same. Yeah, you have particular manifestation of this. You have organism, and so it's only particular features being materialized. And you see what is being materialized, and you want to say what was the geometry of this background space. And the logic, again, is extremely, extremely simple. The, 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 so. Here, 
the, the two genes which are close on the genome have tendency to appear often together because the combination happens somewhere with certain frequency and, uh, and being cut, of course, the closer they are, the less smaller probability that something will separate. And the same is true about real images. So this is from where all structures start, yeah? That if you have, and this is, of course, you have to use in the real world, if you have an image, then, for example, if you put here and you have a brown color, it's very high probability, much higher than on random, near, near, near by my point will be also brown rather than red, yeah? And this kind of enormous effect looks not very little, but because, little, but because it appears many times, it's exponentially dominant, right? It's kind of, it seems very weak, yeah? Because you pass the boundary and color changes. You may have a very small spot, a very small domain. However, because it happens systematically, right, no matter how much you gain in probability, it may be different between, kind of, it may, may non, instead of zero or one half, it may be zero, uh, kind of, um, four, nine, 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 right, or something like that. But this is enormous kind of difference if it repeated many times, yeah, because it repeated many, many times, it goes into exponential and become, so, so may, whether you have this number or you have from the very beginning this number, it kind of makes very little difference. Yeah. They both become infinity or zero when you iterate them. Right? So, and, and, and because of that, uh, granted that, you can say, aha, uh -huh, two points, the distance between them is determined by mutual positive correlation between the, these two points. Yeah. If they often come with the same color or not. You have to take any function. It makes a difference. And if you do it systematically, you observe that this function into variables will have, will have symmetry of the orthogonal group. It may be not a distance. It will be a function of distance. But they all have the same symmetry. And so, but the problem, which is this Poincaré kind of, was kind of obvious to him, but the issue was if you can make realistic, if you can make simple realistic organism, uh, algorithm, so your brain would follow this pattern. And so, well, we, I, I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit later. So, so what, what, can be, what can be expected in this way, what Poincaré was saying about that? And this, of course, we don't know. Of course, still we don't know, and we only can guess. But unless you understand this mathematically, I don't think you, you may have any progress neurophysiologically. Yeah, because we're rather quite elaborate process, which you cannot see by, you know, in, in the microscope unless you unless you think. Okay, now I want to make a little switch and come to, to um, one another point of what I was saying. And uh, different kind of mathematics. So maybe I, I summarize where Mendelian dynamics brings up us that some point remained a little bit unclear, and I want to elaborate on, on this point. So, so one was that it brings forth the following class of dynamical system. You have commutative topological algebra. You have some family of endomorphisms. So they were corresponding in the case of truncated polynomials. You have a linear space decomposed into the product of subspaces, and you have projections on, on, on these coordinates, and this gives you the motion of this algebra. Then you can see the product of some of them. Right? There are many, they take different subsets and different products. With now, this will be only multiplicative of endomorphisms. And then you can see the a, a, a convex combination. Caris, 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 uh, so here is i and j, and here is over this j. And so uh, the kind of dynamics you see in population this, uh, in this ideal, uh, ideal genetics, so it's very simple, I, I repeat. It's no selection, no geography, no nothing. It's just pure probability theory. You come to this class of dynamics and the basic theorem, which I kind of explained very, very roughly says that with, you, you converge to equilibrium exponentially fast. 
And now I want to say what is equilibrium. Why we say equilibrium? So far it was just dynamics. And this is a kind of quite interesting class of dynamics. You know, so this is a class of dynamical system which kind of comes in many occasions. And it's, you know, it's, an, it's not quite clear. So the point, again, would be not just look at this in more general case, but find condition on this endomorphism, especially when this algebra is an algebra of functions. So they come from endomorphism, from topology, homeomorphism, or continuous self-mapping of the space of maximal ideals, when such maps behave in a nice way. A nice way would be, would be when there is a fixed point, either attractive or at least hyperbolic. So it will be attractive, except maybe find in any direction where it may be repelling. Right? These are dynamics which are understandable and kind of feasible. They're simply as possible. So again, it's opposite to the view of, of usual dynamics. Usually in dynamics, you consider simple space and look for most complicated dynamical systems. And here we look at another complicated space, but we want to know the simplest system there. And this is corresponds more or less, more or less to, to biology and to chemistry. You have a huge complicated space, but dynamics there are rather simple, right? rather robust, and essentially like, like fixed point dynamics. How this can be? And this is a model for that. Right? So this is one, one thing. And another thing about equilibrium, and related to this concepts of entropy. So one can show that, yes, yes, let me just again look at the simplest example, then it will be more, more, more clear again. So if you look at this map, which I'm describing in the way of matrices, which I'm explaining, of course, this matrix, which, 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 you know what you know is what matrix is, yeah? It's amazing that even mathematicians say the word matrix. But what is a matrix? Yeah? I was asking, what is a matrix? Yeah. What is the mathem mathematical definition of a matrix? Right? And you, just, you, you have all this abstract mathematics, set theory, and then you say, hi, it's a square table written on the blackboard. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's, not, it's not so obvious yeah, what matrix is. Yeah? And uh, because in different contexts, it may be something different. But anyway, this is, we stick to that, and we consider this. Especially uh, the, the case I want to emphasize when n is a positive numbers and the sums, total sum is 1. And then a, there are special matrices representing this Veronese variety, which are products of rows by columns. And so what are special about them? And if you know this probability theory, you say they are matrices of maximal entropy. They can be defined. So on, on one hand, they kind of this remarkable Veronese kind of sim, sim, very symmetric and uh, 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 some variety after pro, or the projectivize the picture in this in, in this projective space of matrices. On the other hand, they solve this variational problem. And now I want to again to, to repeat what I was saying a little bit uh, more about entropy. So, so, so this process of random matching is just very very physical process. Yeah, it's entropy goes up and converges to its maximum value. In what sense is maximal? It's maximal if you can see the measures here, which has given projections. Now, it's a measure, meaning you have a square table and you put numbers in these places. They are positive, sum equal one, that's a measure. So a discrete measure on, 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 on this. No, maybe I, I, I do it like that. Um, so you put positive weights in all the squares such that sum, these sums are given and these sums are given to you. So the two projections of this measure are given to you. Which of them has maximal entropy? And I remind you what incorrectly called definition of the entropy when you have this weight p sub i, it is sum of this, yes. Yeah. 
minus sum of pi sub the log of pi. It's not a definition. I just I want to say yes. This is what you find, of course, in textbooks, and of course you cannot take as, as a definition. Right? Why log? Why not? You know, exp? Why not sine? Why not cosine? I mean, right? It's kind of absurd as a definition. However, temporarily, temporarily take it, and then because see, the tradition was again I repeat, it was written it, as if it was written by Boltzmann, which was interestingly enough not. It was written first by Planck. This formula, and then it was kind of reiterated many times, especially by Shannon in the discrete context, and it's a certain fundamental concept. But, but my understanding in Boltzmann, though it was not implicit, it was really proven. It is entropy was defined differently, and I want to kind of repeat, repeat a definition of Boltzmann in the kind of in its modern terms, and then this will be kind of outcome of this. However. The fundamental property is this Shannon, what is called Shannon inequality, that if you consider all measures with given projections, then entropy of, of, of this will be smaller than the sum of these two entropies. And the, the, and the equality is even only if this is product of these two. Okay, so it's kind of this uh, rank one matrix. And this is not difficult inequality in a way, but still kind of significant, and why this pi and log pi. And now let me explain it is in, in, a, in a, what I think is a b better, better terms. That they, again, that you, you can understand this without formulas, yeah, up to a certain point. But then, up to, uh, but then this formula becomes really significant, but uh, on a very kind of rather advanced level. And so this is, so we want to, so, so what, I, what I want is to, to kind of reconstruct the, the kind of naive thinking of our kind of physicists, not physical lecture. Boltzmann was not in a way a physicist, and he was active. physicist did not take him for a physicist. He was considered applied mathematician. He was extremely mathematically minded, yeah? And uh, he made con fundamental contribution to physics, but still he was essentially a mathematician. Yeah? And uh, so what he was doing, he was not discovering new physical laws. He was really discovering how to put them into a new, new mathematical framework. And now, yes, in modern language, I think what he was thinking, just I read his kind of book on gas theory a long time ago, but, this, uh, but this, uh, I certainly don't remember that the feeling you can get is as follows. So you have these objects, finite probability spaces. And they're extremely kind of simple minded objects, they're just a bunch of stones, and you normalize their weights, total sum will be one. You take the union, units of measurement and such, the total weight is one. And this bunch of these stones, yeah. So this already, for me, abuse of notation, because you use here numbers, and there is no numbers in there, right? They're not ordered by any means, just these stones. And then you can bring some stones together. Better think about them not as stones, as drops of water. For example, you can bring, bring these together, it will be slightly one bigger one, and these together will be this one. And this means that this has probability spaces, and there are morphism between them. So it's a category. And uh, in a second, I explain how physically this actually you, you have it, yeah. You don't have these numbers, you really have category, yeah. Right. These objects themselves, the spaces, you just don't see them. But you see these morphisms. And this is a, the point I want to make. It look again, I, just, I, I, I was saying it already, I keep repeating it. You can say, aha, when you have this arrow, it's I as if you have just this inequality, right? And this space is bigger than another. Because all this map has subjection. So it's, but the fundamental difference, conceptual, notational, is when you be, we'll be speaking about entropy, we shall we'll ha have entropy of morphisms. You cannot write entropy of this sign. Yeah? It's just meaningless. They're logically different objects, having morphism or putting this sign. And this is kind of, kind of looks very trivial, kind of different, but this completely changes perspective. Right? So I want to think this as an error. The moment I have it, certainly you must be careful. This is a category which is a topological category, 
right? Because there is topology inside. Yeah, these are real numbers, they're not abstract. Of course, this makes sense when they are objects from any additive group. However, or even semi-group, but for me they're number, real numbers, so I remember topology secretly. But right. but then they're saying, aha, if I have a category, and I out of this I want to produce something simple. And this simple, you know, the recipe of that, we take the growth in the group of this category without thinking, right? Say growth in the group. This is a logical category, so growth in the group. A priori, it will be not a group. Group is the next level, take semi-group, which means just when you have a, a morphism F, G equal H, right? You say that F plus G equal H in this growth in the group, right? As simple as that. Just, you just make everything commutative. And then you have a, because it's a topological category, you get some topological semigroup. If you don't take topological, you have something huge, uncountable, it will be too bad, yeah. So, but you take it, in, in, in topology, there is only one topology you can do it. And the moment you say it, we may just think what the semigroup will be, and this will be the semigroup of positive no of numbers greater than one under multiplication. You can compute it, yeah? And this is, this is quality, and this is called the law of large numbers. And then log, so for, for each morphism, in particular to each object, which is morphing to, the, to one point, there is one point space here, you assign this element of growth in the group, and this happens to be a number, and for some reason you take log of this. And this again is highly not obvious why you take log, but you may take log. Uh, naturally, it's multiplicative group, but you take log. And then you have entropy. And you cannot argue with this. Yeah. It means growth in the group is not something, you know, ad hoc given to you. It is just inside of this structure. Now let's explain why it is so. And I think it's quite, quite, quite a It's just, of course, there is no new technically anything new. What I'm saying, but conceptually, I think it gives you feeling much better about entropy. You know, when you see this, and this, I think, how Boltzmann was doing, think about that, and I explain why. And then you, it follows, it's, it's more always given by this formula. You can compute it easily, once you know that. But it is the law of large numbers behind it. Otherwise, it would make no sense. This formula makes sense only because of the law of large numbers. And then, lots of properties of entropy, which we, we prove by some computation, that follow from functoriality. Because it's natural, functorial, teratai, just, you know, in particular, the shell inequality, which I said, namely that if you have measure and has these two projections, then entropy of the whole thing less or equal than the sum of the two. And it is uh, kind of become just exactly kind of physical, naive, which I explained, naive physical reasoning becomes rigorous proof because it's functorial. Right? So everything which was kind of blamed about on, on Boltzmann that he was not rigorous. And I think the point is mathematics was not ready. Mathematics had no language to say what he was saying. And there were two in two points. Yeah, one it was from functorial language had in mind, and yes, I think it applies to many other things he's done and still not transformed to the modern language, like Boltzmann equation, right? So for example, this is a Boltzmann entropy, and you can say it is element from growth in the group, and then you are happy and just, of course you have to prove law of large numbers, but you know beforehand what it is. Now, what is Boltzmann equation? Of course people don't know what it is. They write this equation, it's absurd, yeah? You, because if you think about this, you know about this equation, you don't have to write it, but you cannot say it in words. And you write a formula because you have no mathematical language to say exactly what it is. It also is a functor between certain categories, but we don't know what the categories are. Right? And this is how boys were thinking. And objection of mathematicians, particularly were because it, you know, he, didn't, he, was not, he was saying it in the language of mathematics of, of 19th century. And another, of course, th thing he was using all the time implicitly was non-standard analysis. Always we were thinking those terms again and again, this language was not, not ready, as we can say it now. Because in a, in a way, entropy must be understood as growth in the group of non-standard completion of this category. Kind of the, uh, the better way to think about that is when you use, it's, it's unneeded at the beginning, but when you go deeper, you see it becomes absolutely essential. It's, you have to take so-called non-standard completion of this uh, non-standard model of this category. 
you, you have to look at spaces when all these numbers become infinite because it only appears in the limit, and this is not surprising. And that what you see in physics when you have rather big numbers. Okay, now let me explain why it is so. Why this growth in the group enters here. And uh, so, what is the law of large numbers? So, first, in this context, this is a essential point. Actually, I don't know. It's certainly, what I'm saying is in slightly different terms as well known, but I couldn't find I couldn't find them as uh, references. For some of them, I found words people use, yeah, and uh, in, in probability theory, but not for everything. So, what is the law of large numbers? And again, as we see, yes, kind of mathematics, which are very similar to what was happening in this Mendelian dynamics, slightly different aspect of that. And uh, so, you have a probability space P. And this is a bunch of atoms with different weights. And in this category of, of and this is essential, of, of mm, probability spaces, you have Cartesian product, which is a very simple thing in this example. You just multiply them as sets. And when you have atom here and atom here, the weight will be product of two atoms. Yeah, you better to say you have segment here, segment here, you have the square. Yeah, it's an unquestionable product. You must be careful actually in what sense it's. It, 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 it is a product, but it is Cartesian product. So what the law of large numbers says, well, when it, uh, it applies, it, apl it applies to this high Cartesian power when n goes to infinity. And when I say no standard analysis, in fact, much of what you do, you don't have to be this kind of power. It may be just space, and, but this is a, not a limit of the sequence, but just finite probability space when n is an infinitely large number. So it's a number, but it's, so it's a finitely many atoms, but finitely, but finitely understood in a non standard way. And, uh, well, and there is now good justification to think in those terms, because got many, many. There is some kind of mathematical theory, highly non-trivial, of, of due to Lewis Boyne exploiting this idea. And you prove really hard theorems with, 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 with this way of thinking. But, uh, but uh, the law of large numbers concerns this. So what is the, uh, how this space behaves when n goes to infinity? Now, among all probability spaces, um, there are something we can call homogeneous spaces. And homogeneous, of course, where all atoms have equal weight. And observe this again, it's kind of categorical notion. Yeah? It's kind of makes sense purely categorically. You, you, you say it in those terms, but you homogeneous, and the objects are highly homogeneous. And the law of large numbers says that these things when n goes to infinity, or maybe we say 2 to p to the n, is asymptotically homogeneous. Now, why this would kind of settle this matter about growth in the group and in everything? Yeah. So, entropy by functoriality. If you from definition of growth in the group by functoriality, must be multiplicative under products. When we take log, it becomes additive, yeah? But it's you know, so well, if you write additively the group, it will be additive, yeah? It's a multiplicative group, you write additively. So you have entropy, whatever it is, of P, P times Q must be equal entropy of P times or cross depending again with annotations of entropy of Q. That's a kind of co consequence of, of so here I speak about entropy of objects rather than morphisms. In this particular instance it's kind of it, it is sufficient. 
But of course, when you go kind of next level, it becomes not 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 it's not it's all the same, yeah. And uh, on the other hand, so if something is homogeneous and kind of the kind of the only kind of you look at the category of sets and corresponding kind of growth in the group, whatever, of course, everything you have is just cardinality of a set. Right? So your entropy must be kind of generalization of cardinality. So when the homogeneous object, and this equation of normalization, as I said, is growth in the group, but I said, but there is some ambiguity about what is one and the, what, what is one. Yeah, what is kind of can multiply it by a constant or by use different base of logarithm. And so normalization would be when all atoms have equal weight, you want this entropy to, e to be equal cardinality. If it's cardinality, it will be multiplicative. If it's log of cardinality, it will be additive. Right? So this is normalization you have. It must be understood that there are lots of functions with this property. A priori, there are enormous number of this. For example, if you take sum of weights squared, or well, a cube here, whatever. This, this quantity is multiplicative and, uh, and uh, this is Cartesian products, right? So there are lots and lots of them. If you think, think in, in terms of a Laplace transform, it is a whole kind of world of, uh, you can describe all these multiplicative invariances that will be essentially the space of function, all Laplace transform of all these all, all this ways, yeah. Well, essentially, of course, the APIs to the power lambda in their combinations, yeah. So, so a huge number of them. And uh, <coughs> which corresponds to Laplace transform, of course, of the corresponding distribution functions. But the point is, yeah, that the usual entropy is kind of a, has extra property. So these are multiplicative for all weights. But the entropy which we construct will be not. It will be kind of marginally multiplicative in only under the condition that sum of pi equals 1. So in, in particular, this, this you can check. This is simple computation, but it's not a kind of a priori obvious. You have to check it. But this thing is, this entropy satisfies this property. Well, I can put minus here. It does hurt. But only using this condition. If you take something like that, you don't need any condition. You put here any lambda. Yeah. And this thing is multiplicative, of course. This, this norm is multiplicative. but 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 the, the entropy will be additive only under this condition. And but another feature of that that it is maximally continuous. It's certainly when you say this, when you say this, um, kind of topological category, which topology you use, and you have to use exactly topology which guaranteed by the law of large numbers. And as I, as I said, the law of large numbers says. The things are asymptotically homogeneous. So when you take very high power, almost all atoms will have almost the same weights. And this is the law of large numbers. Because applied to log, so if you apply formally additive, of course you can use multiplicative group, but if you use it as log in your form, you take log p, think about this function, this probability space. And this function becomes almost constant additively, which means that all atoms become approximately equal. What does it mean approximately? In what sense? So it's a, in a rather weak sense, but exactly in this weak topology which you use, which you use for entropy. So let me explain what is, yeah, well, I, don't, well, I have just two words and then we'll continue next time. So I have to compare, I want to compare two different probability spaces and say what means they're close. And then I can say what it means to be close, close, close to a homogeneous space, right? So I need to introduce some kind of metric on the space of probability spaces. And here immediately, when I do that, I have to work with non-standard numbers. So n will be very, very large number. It will be not property of individual space. It only makes sense when numbers are huge, and only that will be used, yeah? So we don't care about spaces being close as they are. They might be close when n goes to infinity. Or Better to think about this kind of no, huge, yes, non standard number. Non standard being huge, non specified number. Right? And this is the following thing. There are two notions of being close, and they're being kind of brought up together. 
One is additive and one is multiplicative. And this is, again, quite significant, because in probability theory, there is both additivity of measure and multiplicativity coming from, from kind of independence. Yeah? And you have to use both of them. It's very simple, the, kind of the most naive you can do will be there. Additive is very simple. If you have one measure space and throw away a subset of small measure, it, 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 you agree it is close. So if n is infinitely large, you throw, you throw away infinitely small piece of measure, and they become equal. Okay? So this is why in standard analysis is very convenient. You don't have to specify this number. Right? In the limit, it means when n goes to infinity, uh, this, you, you throw away a small and smaller part, and the, the, the rest, what remains, is close. So they converge. And secondly, what do you mean multiplicatively? Multiplicatively is trickier. So here, you see, the number n does not enter. Yeah, just something small. This makes sense regardless of the number. When you take multiplicative, you have two spaces, and you have weights here and weights there. You look at their ratio. You want this to the power of 1 over n to be close to 1. So another way op operation which makes spaces close, you multiply them by weights, but such that when we take this root, this factor will be close to 1. Right? So we mix this to the notion of closeness. And then you can say, well, that two spaces, depending on parameter n and another parameter n, so the distance goes to 0. Now it makes sense. It means that one obtained by another by two of these operations. Finitely many, if you wish, but two will do. Yeah. You so you allow throwing aging sets of small measure, and you multiply them by weights, such that square root of this, not square root, this root of this will be small to one. And the law of large numbers says, in this sense, for, any, for, for, for this power, there is a sequence Qn, or called Hn, of homogeneous spaces, such that their distance converges to 0. So. For, 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 for sufficiently large n, every space approximated by homogeneous spaces. And then, the moment you say it, you kind of know anything about entropy. Because entropy is multiplicative, by definition, by functoriality. And now we know it also must be continuous with respect to this metric. So when you take p to the n, because it becomes asymptotically homogeneous, its entropy will be equal to the entropy of this, but because you took n's power, entropy multiplies by n. So I have to divide, take entropy of this creature and divide by n in this kind of growth in the group. By the law of large numbers, but now, but because it became constant, it becomes its cardinality. And so it's log of cardinality. So everything you have to know about entropy, you, just, you can read it from cardinality. You can forget about measures. It is the same as cardinality. It's exactly mentality of Boltzmann. So what is entropy of a system? It's the number of uh, states. Entropy is log of the number of states. So there is no weights. Weights disappear when the system is large enough, because all weights become equal. And, uh, and uh, so everything reduced to this kind of a homogeneous case. And anything you want to prove about entropy follows from what you know about sets. So next time I explain how you kind of Elaborate on that in the same functorial way you continue, because this is entropy about its finite measure spaces. And kind of the big, big advance of entropy was in dynamical system, I think, in 1958. By when Kolmogorov proven that entropy serves as this kind of entropy serves as invariant of dynamical system. He introduced this dynamical entropy, and then it was kind of polished by Sinai. And uh, this entropic, entropic theory. And then you shall see that if you take this point of view, this becomes kind of apparent. Yeah. You don't have to even, both formulation proofs become just, you don't know what to, what, 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 what to, uh, just automatic. Just all these definitions, because it's just extension, just purely functorial categorical extension of what I said. You extend this language kind of completed in a categorical way, and you arrive at all the theory. And it's, it's one. And then more recently, about a couple of years ago, there was another 
line exactly, I mean, following just Boltzmann kind of reasoning. Yeah? You just take Boltzmann reasoning, what he was saying, translate it to this language, and you get all this uh, Hamagorov entropy with all definition and, 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 and theorems. Just from words, I mean, for nothing. Just re reinterpret what Boltzmann says in, in a categorical way. And what he says is just hand waving, by the way. There is no kind of really hard core mathematics in that. Yeah. But a but, but, but much more, more subtle point was done recently when you pursue this another line of thought corresponding to this non standard analysis. And this is more subtle, and this was uh, elaborated uh, by Louis Boyen. And you have a next extension of the entropy, which is much more, much more sophisticated when it, it solves a more difficult question and brings us to the, what we don't know. So, and, uh, and so next time I'll start explaining how you can arrive at all that by kind of thinking in kind of physical terms. It will be as remote from physics as what I was saying here was remote from biology, but you start with what you think is physics, and as a mathematician, just translate when they very naive think into mathematical language. You partly I've done it, and then I can kind of do it uh, in a more elaborate way next time. Okay, so today finished.